Good evening. Um, I'm uh, Leela Gandhi. I'm the director of the Pembroke Centre, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you virtually to the Pembroke Centre and to this um, event organised under the auspices of our newly launched LGBTQIA plus thinking initiative. The um, LGBTQ um, uh, uh, plus uh, 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 TQIA plus thinking initiative is um, uh, led by Lynn Joyrich, who is Professor of Modern Culture and Media, and it's devoted to the active production of knowledge generated from and about sexual and gender minorities. Uh, uh, Lynn Joyrich, whom you'll be hearing from uh, in the course of this evening, uh, our, our director of this initiative, is Professor of Modern Culture and Media. She's uh, a Director of Graduate Studies, um, in the uh, department, in the MCM department, and a scholar whose research focuses on constructions of gender, sexuality, and race in US media. Um, she is the author of Reviewing Reception, Television, Gender, and Postmodern Culture, and of numerous articles on film, television, cultural studies, and feminist and queer studies that have appeared in flagship journals, such as The Black Scholar, Critical Inquiry, Cinema Journal, Discourse, Jump Cut, and uh, in various uh, book anthologies. Um, she's been a member of the editorial collective of the journal Camera Obscura, Feminism, Culture and Media Studies since 1996. And it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to give over to her for what promises to be an excellent evening. Thank you so much, Leela, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so yes, I thank you so much, Leela, and I wanna thank uh, everybody for being here today, particularly, of course, all that's going on these days. And I wanna welcome everyone to this symposium on Over the Rainbow, Reconsidering the Pride Flags. One of the many scholarly, pedagogical, and community goals of the LGBTQIA plus thinking initiative is to enhance the Pembroke Center and to enhance the Pembroke Center seminar, which is always a very stimulating and vital part of intellectual and community life at Brown. Uh, so again, thank you, Leela, for that. Uh, this year, the Pembroke seminar itself is being led by Leslie Bostrom and Evie Lincoln, uh, and it revolves around the fascinating topic, very broadly understood, of color in, in everything that that could mean. But what better link between the topic of color and LGBTQIA++ issues than the rainbow flag, which of course is known for its striking use of color. As many of you no doubt know, the rainbow flag, the rainbow pride flag was designed as a symbol of the gay community by San Francisco artist Gilbert Baker in 1978, becoming a well-known international symbol of gay pride. Since that time, the rainbow flag has come to signify a broader global LGBTQ plus coalition, even as there have been proposals for changes to the rainbow flag, such more recently, such as the addition of stripes or chevrons to signal racial inclusion, trans inclusion, and so on. So the proposals for changes to the flag, as well as for the creation of additional flags featuring their own unique color schemes to represent various groups in the wider LGBTQIA community. The popularization of the original flag, as well as these redesigns and additions, have been both lauded and critiqued, with various commentators raising questions of aesthetics, politics, and performativity, the commercialization, commodification, and branding of queer identities, 
international homogeneity and or local heterogeneity signal by flags, diversity, inclusion, and intersectionality that they mark, the recognition, representation, and or maybe reification of specific identities through changes to the flag and so on. All of these issues, again, like I said, that have been lauded by some, critiqued by others. This symposium over the rainbow, reconsidering the pride flags, will explore just such issues with our panel about whom I'll say more in a moment. And with those of you listening, as you're all encouraged, strongly encouraged to submit questions and comments via the question tab on Zoom. And please do feel free to start posting your questions at any time during presentations and we'll be collecting them for, for uh, doing them at the end. Now, as is probably obvious, uh, our title over the rainbow is a bit of a pun given the multiple possibility, uh, the multiple possible meanings of that phrase, right? So multiple meanings that perhaps already signal varying possibilities about perspectives on the pride flag, right? And on the variety of pride flags today. With the recognition of multiple gender and sexual possibilities signaled by pride flags, are we, would we wanna say, are we now over the rainbow in the sense that we're beyond it, that LGBTQIA plus folks have somehow made it, right? We're, and so no longer need something like the pride flag or to the contrary, are we still trying, will we always be trying to get over that hump, right? That arc of the rainbow promising new possibilities. Do pride flags help actualize those possibilities? Or does it no longer seem as if that's the case? That is, are we sort of in a more cynical way just over it, right? Tired of all that's been invested in this symbol, including literal corporate investment and, and therefore maybe wary of how pride may have become nothing but hype? Or is the value of the rainbow image that we can never get over it? Right, that the rainbow, all, a rainbow always remains on the horizon. And thus that the rainbow flag, all of the various rainbow flags, you know, can those still move us today, even as, or especially because we keep considering and reconsidering these questions. But before we get into those questions for this symposium, uh, there is one important consideration now that I do just wanna pause on for a moment sort of taking a slight detour from these thoughts about the rainbow to also more soberly highlight and question the very idea of flags given the world situation at the moment. Particularly, I wanna recognize the horror of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the terrible tragedy for the Ukrainian people and the potential terrible risk for among so many others there LGBTQ folks in Ukraine, given Russia's homophobic and transphobic and so many other alarming policies. So these very sobering thoughts, I think, you know, can maybe seem quite far afield from the ideas and images that usually come to mind and thinking about the rainbow flag. But I do think for this forum and beyond it at this moment, it is important to pause and consider what it even means to group and fight under the banner of flags, right? So the sort of deeply troubling nationalistic, imperialistic, conquering invocations that have historically been and clearly still are attached to the use of some flags. Yet perhaps it's equally important, of course, to think about how symbols, including flags, can be redeployed in other ways, maybe even against aspects of histories. And so how the pride flag itself and the transnational mobilizations that it has engendered, how that's valuable to consider even in the light of the devastating situation now in Ukraine, indeed, especially in that light. So that issue of course is very complex, its own very important topic with aspects that go you know, well beyond just our focus today. But as I said, I did want to recognize that before we get into the heart of our program. 
That heart of the program is provided by our wonderful panelists who will be speaking on a variety of issues related to the pride flag or now multiplicity of flags. Um, I'll be introducing each of the panelists before they speak um, in the interest of time because we do have a packed program. I'll give only brief introductions to each but they are all very fascinating. So I encourage you to click on the links that will be in the chat in order to look at the large, the longer bios of all of our participants. Uh, I do want to note though, that with all of the things going on these days, the situation in Ukraine, people still getting sick with COVID or caring for those who are sick and so on. Because of that, there have been some sort of emergencies and therefore we unfortunately are down a couple of panelists who had been listed on the publicity. So sadly, like I said, emergencies came up at the last minute and neither Majida Kargbo nor Michael J. Murphy can be here today, but we still have a full and very lively panel made up of four terrific people uh, and people variously working across creative artistic production, curation, cultural critique, scholarship and education. So I'm very excited to hear uh, all of them. So, but to start us off uh, of those wonderful panelists, uh, first we have Michelle Miller Fisher, who is currently the Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And she has previous experience curating at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Met, the Guggenheim, and as you'll hear about, New York's Museum of Modern Art. She's the author of the beautiful illustrated children's book, Rainbow Flag, Bright, Bold, and Beautiful. And she'll be speaking to us today about the rainbow flag at MoMA. So please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thank you so much, Professor Joyrich and everybody at Pembroke for having me. It's really a delight to be with you this evening. Um, I will spend about five, seven, maybe 10 minutes, depending on how long it takes, um, to offer a little bit of historical context about the work I do as a curator. Um, I'm now at the MFA in Boston, as Professor Joyrich said, but I was for four years between 2014 and 2018 at MoMA, which is where, where I really began as a design curator. And it was there that I collected the rainbow flag into our modern, modern and contemporary design collection. So I'm going to give a little bit of historical context for how that happened, how um, the rainbow flag designed by Gilbert Baker and others in 1978 became part of a museum design collection. Um, and to think a little bit about what that means, although I really hope in the q and I, I would really welcome questions about um, what it means to collect works like this into um, a design collection or, or into um, any kind of museum or cultural organization collection. So this is what um, the collection object entry looks like on MoMA.org um, for Gilbert Baker's rainbow flag. And I want to come back to the question of um, authorship and how museums and especially the sort of database that is behind a website like this um, often really doesn't um, allow for complexities and nuance around collaborative projects, um, around projects that happen um, and that come from cultural moments as much as they do people. Um, but this is what it looks like online. And this is the moment in time that we first um, raised the rainbow flag at MoMA on June 26, 2015. And I'll explain how that happened momentarily. And this is Gilbert visiting it um, a, a couple of months later. Um, I was looking back at photographs for this presentation to share with you, and I'm sorry these are so grainy, but it was actually at a moment in my life where not everything was immediately photographed or videoed. Um, it seems like a much simpler time in a way, so I actually don't have a huge amount of documentation of the moment the flag went up, for example, because it was such an enjoyable moment. And most people, I, I, I don't know anyone who actually captured it on, on video, for example. It was a moment that was uh, captured with our eyes. So. To contextualize the rainbow flag coming into MoMA's collection, design collection 2015, it's helpful to understand a little bit about what that design collection is and how it was formed. Um, so MoMA was founded in 1929 as a museum dedicated to the art of its time, so um, looking predominantly at living artists. 
Um, and this is an image of its very first design um, exhibition that happened shortly thereafter in 1934. And it's called Machine Art. It's an exhibition that I return to often when I'm thinking about design, material culture, decorative arts, craft. Um, this one was curated by uh, two men, and that was um, pretty much the norm in the architecture and design department until at least a few decades later. Um, but uh, those two men were Alfred Barr, who was the founding director of the museum, and Philip Johnson, um, the architect who came to have an outsized impact, both as a curator at MoMA, but also in his own practice on uh, US and um, European architecture of the 20th century. And in this particular exhibition, they sort of set the direction for the way that MoMA's collection was formed. And so, as you can see, they picked um, everyday technological models. Uh, the museum at the time was in a townhouse on West 55th Street. And so they had an airplane propeller greeting people. Um, they had springs and coils. They had a self-aligning ball bearing. They had um, uh, scientific glass beakers. Um, and their intent was very literally, um, but also conceptually and, and metaphorically, to um, raise the uh, status of everyday objects of design, to fetishize the technical in a way, to think about what is machine made rather than handmade. They very deliberately said it was a sort of anti handcraft show. Um, and this really set the direction for modern contemporary design in the decades to come. Um, in the 40s and 50s, there were the good design exhibitions. Um, so MoMA became not only in its galleries, but also in its store, as it is today, a machine for encouraging consumption, both visual consumption coming into the museum, but also consumption of objects of goods that can be brought back to your home to furnish it with. So thinking about those um, elements and ideas of taste. And that was carried on also in this notion of a humble masterpiece or an everyday item. I was lucky enough when I was at MoMA to work under the contemporary design curator who's been there for now over a quarter century, an absolutely amazing, thoughtful, incredible curator, Paola Antonelli. Um, she continues to be a really great mentor of mine. And um, she did this exhibition in 2004, Humble Masterpieces. Um, she brought back out the self-aligning ball bearing. She was looking directly at um, Johnson and Barr's show from 1934, but she added in the chopper chop, the big pen, the white t-shirt. She had a condom in there, um, lots and lots of everyday items that you see around us, we see around us all of the time, um, have incredibly interesting design histories, but had not necessarily been um, uh, investigated with any great depth in favor of sort of the architecture and design masters of the 20th century that had been collected into um, uh, MoMA's galleries and, and the permanent collection too. So when Paola got to the museum in the 90s, she started trying to think about ways in which um, the design canon might be expanded. And just before I got to the museum, she was uh, one of the first places to really think about digital design and the ways in which that met a collecting institution. So she acquired digital fonts. Um, she also started acquiring signs and symbols, and this is where it comes to the rainbow flag. Um, so back in 2010, she acquired the at sign, um, the uh, at that we all use in our email addresses, um, was designed by Ray Tomlinson in 1971 as part of the email protocol, the domain name, the, 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 um, the sign between our own name and the domain name um, that we now take absolutely for granted. When we say acquire, um, Paula didn't pay or MoMA didn't pay any money for the at sign, nor does it own any rights over it, um, but it brought it into the collection conceptually um, to recognize it as a really important symbol of design that had changed the ways in which we live our lives as one of these sort of humble masterpieces um, over the last half century. And so we started to bring in other symbols and icons as well. One of my favorites that I worked on was Susan Cares. Um, she was uh, a young graphic designer who graduated from NYU in the early 1980s, needed a job, and her friend from high school said, oh, you should come and work for this startup company that I'm working for on the West Coast uh, called Apple Macintosh. And she said, oh, why not? I suppose they will. Um, and we were lucky enough to acquire the sketchbooks that she used when she was starting to map out some of the icons that we now absolutely take for granted and are part of the Mac suite. Um, so we had both these digital icons and symbols that we were bringing to the collection 
abstraction, things like Susan's work that was very, very analog, although um, her sketchbooks, of course, had been made digital, and then things that sort of lived um, in between. So the, um, the on off, the power button, these are really interesting design histories to to, to research and to write about, um, things like the creative common symbols. We really tried to think expansively. Um, I even tried to get in at this point in time, not that it was a symbol or an icon, but I was uh, looking at humble masterpieces as sort of a, a, a wider uh, phenomenon. And I tried to get a breast pump acquired at MoMA um, that went down like a lead balloon, which led to a different project that now has become a book and an exhibition other, in other spaces called Designing Motherhood. Um, but it gave us the context to thinking about what other icons um, and symbols of design could come into the collection. And so in um, 2014, in later 2014, I suggested to Paola, um, actually the rainbow flag is a really interesting design history. Somebody who was connected to its original design, Gilbert Baker lives in New York. And so it would be possible to say hello to him and to ask him about that design history um, and to think about bringing that object into the museum's collection. It was also at a moment in time where we were creating this exhibition. It was a collection reinstallation. Um, it was called This Is For Everyone, um, Design For The Common Good. And, um, design experiment, sorry, for the common good. And it seemed like a natural place to um, include amongst the many different designs, um, the uh, rainbow flag as well. The title for this exhibition came from one of my very favorite um, moments over the last decade or so. Tim Berners-Lee, who's the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, was right there at the beginning of the Summer Olympics. Um, and uh, as part of the choreography tweeted out, this is for everybody. And I remember saying to my partner at the time, Time. What an incredibly beautiful moment, um, thinking about somebody who was using the World Wide Web to tell everybody that the World Wide Web was something that he had designed for them. Um, I think I was both more naive about the ways in which um, that particular medium works in general um, then than I, than I am now. Um, but it also precipitated me about 30 seconds later to actually Google how many people did have access to the internet. Um, and at that point in time, it's now changed, but at that point in, in time, it was actually very much the minority of folks in the world rather than the majority who had access to this particular resource. So we were interested in thinking about histories of marginalization through some of these um, items that we had on the checklist for the This Is For Everyone exhibition um, and being able to tell as many design stories as we could. Um, so we included many of the other um, icons and symbols in the exhibition. But we proposed the um, uh, rainbow flag to our uh, committee. Um, it, it takes a, a process to get anything to come into a museum's collection. Um, you have to write a, a rationale. You have to um, make a place for it within the collection history, um, the design, the wider design history. And so it took us a little bit longer than the um, start of the This Is For Everyone exhibition. But by June of 2015, when the exhibition was still up, um, as part of our collection rotation. Um, we had connected with Gilbert, we had interviewed him about his part in creating the rainbow flag. He talked about it as a group exercise, as something that really had taken many, many hands to create. Um, and so we recorded that as part of an interview, which we published, and you see it just here on MoMA's blog. Um, and that was in uh, mid-June. And so we had instructed our exhibition designer to um, find the right flagpole for it so that we could put it up into the galleries. And um, just under 10 days later, that's when the Supreme Court decision around same-sex marriage came down. And we decided that that would then be the day. So it went up on June 26, 2015. Um, this is one of the amazing uh, MoMA art handlers uh, putting it up. <laughs> The image is so grainy that I actually don't know who it is, um, but it went up within this exhibition context um, and it was a really celebratory moment. It was one of those moments actually working as a museum curator that it felt just um, as if you could do something that was useful in the world. Um, and that is not a feeling that I have often in my profession. Um, but uh, we had a group of people who were gathering, watching it go up, and it really had a very sustained and sort of wonderful audience for it um, for that first afternoon that it was up in the museum. We also wanted to create something that would be 
um, a longer lasting or part of this longer lasting um, conversation around the design. And so um, about a year and a half after the rainbow flag was brought into the collection, I talked to our um, uh, education department. I had some fantastic colleagues in education and also our director of publishing at MoMA, Chris Hudson, and asked if we could do a children's book around this particular design. And he immediately said, yes. Um, I co-wrote it or co-created co it with an absolutely brilliant illustrator. You see her name here, Kat Kong. It was important for me um, that it was a, a, a co-production between both the illustrator and um, uh, myself providing text. And so Kat's images are absolutely glorious and they tell um, the story of the design of the rainbow flag, um, the way in which uh, Gilbert and uh, Lynn Sagerblom and others had expertises in tie-dyeing, had interest in vexillography, how the bicentennial in 1976 um, really precipitated Gilbert's interest in flags, um, how he was interested, um, and so was Lynn too, in thinking about uh, something kaleidoscopic, something that came from the sky, something that um, could be made completely their own, something that came from this expertise in dyeing, in being able to work with um, color and fabric. Um, and so we created uh, a children's book, which has now become extremely popular at MoMA. Um, Kat got paid for it. I did not uh, as part of uh, my work product at MoMA. So it's something I'm just very joyful that it's um, part of, of the world um, and something that I've gifted and read to many small people in my life. Um, and so that's the, the context for the flag coming to the museum collection. It entered in 2015. I left the museum in 2018. Um, and I'm really excited to have a conversation this evening about the many flags that have come after um, this particular pride flag, the way in which I think um, I might have collected more of them had I stayed longer at MoMA with this particular collection. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, conversation and connection that can happen between them. I'm I'm also really interested in conversations and questions about um, who writes history and how do we write it. I think museum collections are very good at dealing with solo authors. Um, that's, you know, the, the way that collection entries for Picasso and Brack and all those um, heavy hitters that MoMA has in its collection work. Um, when it comes to architecture and design, which are much more collaborative endeavors and craft and community, it's more difficult to think about how to break some of the museum's desire to silo and to pigeonhole. Um, and so thinking about how museum labeling for collective and community efforts happens is something that interests me deeply and I'm not sure that there is a perfect model for it yet. Um, so I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. I really welcome any questions and, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was fascinating um, and, and a great way to start giving us that history. So thank you. Um, Next up is Alex V. Green, who completed an MA in political science at the University of Toronto Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies, and who currently studies law. Alex is also a writer, researcher, and public intellectual who has been featured on such sites and in such publications as A-Side, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, uh, Gawker, Jewish Currents, Jezebel Slate, Teen Vogue, This Magazine, Extra Magazine, and even more. Uh, and they will be speaking this afternoon, I guess now already this evening, um, on rainbow capitalism and its contradictions. So welcome, Alex. Hi there. Um, so funny to hear myself called a public intellectual. Um, I would never be so self-indulgent, but I'll take it. Um, uh, thank you all so much. Um, I was contacted to participate in this um, in relation to an article I'd written for The Atlantic last year. Um, and that was a, a excuse me, <laughs> um, and that article um, uh, started off by taking up um, a recent redesign of the pride flag to add um, the intersex symbol um, and to sort of ask kind of leading questions about, um, you know, this evolving flag um, and these various attempts to make it more inclusive and, and what that actually means. 
Um, and through that experience, I, I had the opportunity to talk to um, several individuals who had their own uh, complicated relationships with the pride flag. Um, one thing that really uh, emerged consistently, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this whole backstory because I, I got the note that, that we have more time than originally planned. So you're getting, <laughs> this is the unprepared part of the speech. Um, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, a theme that, that emerged consistently, uh, people especially in um, you know, regions of the United States and Canada, um, where um, certain attitudes towards queer and trans people aren't necessarily as reliable or, or um, you know, easily taken for granted as in other places. Um, uh, you know, so, so even though people recognize that the flag, you know, only communicates so much, it has its problems. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, it gave them a sense of safety and strength um, uh, in situations where they might not otherwise have, um, you know, an ally, for lack of a better term. Um, other people, you know, uh, noted that. But at the same time, um, we're very critical um, of this most recent and other efforts to sort of expand the representability of the flag. Um, and, and there was a, a, a very cogent sort of critique that was offered um, uh, by an acquaintance of mine who um, is herself um, trans and intersex um, about how like this sort of the addition of this symbol um, did a kind of clumsy work of conflating um, certain experiences that intersex people have um, with those of the sort of broader um, imagined LGBT community. Um, and, that, and, and she sort of correctly pointed out that, and I won't get into that in, in much depth right now, um, but, but she correctly pointed out that um, this is sort of a trend that exists beyond the immediate experience of intersex people, but also just broadly when we look at all the communities that have been um, intentionally um, included within you know, each revised flag. Um, anyway, this talk is less about the flag itself and is more about um, how the flag kind of exists as one of many symbols, um, as part of a kind of revised, um, or if I'm gonna be pointed, revisionist, um, quote unquote, LGBT community. Um, I, I think, um, I think critiques of visibility, which sort of especially pop up during Pride um, and in relation to Pride, um, ends up living in the sort of space of, of um, you know, a, a critiquing an, an, an imagined kind of inauthenticity or insufficiency of certain efforts at inclusion. The idea is being, and I'll, I'll just make an example, you know, like, oh, like Coca-Cola loves gay people now. Well, how do we know they like gay people? You don't really know like gay people, blah, blah, blah. Um, that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, there's a, a frequent misuse of the word performative and that like people, <laughs> like they, they claim that it's performative to be like sort of gesturing towards um, queer audiences at this particular time. I think these are valid critiques, but I, I what I kind of want to intervene in uh, through this talk um, are sort of assumptions that are kind of built into that and how that fits sort of within like a, like a broader project in relation to the, the, the symbols associated with quote unquote LGBT rights in an imagined LGBT community. Um, so I had two goals after that sort of like long introduction. And I, I don't know if I've even hinted at them fully that introduction, but I'll just, I'll make my theses a uh, uh, plane right from the jump. Um, one is that while it's valid and valuable to bristle against seemingly inauthentic or insufficient efforts at comprehensive representation, even within this framework, we've already given up ground by considering or rendering representation as something that is in itself desirable or advantageous. We've, we've accepted the notion that representation is a good that we should strive for. The second point, and this is maybe a little bit more inflammatory, is that there is a direct and reciprocal relationship between these gestures at inclusion, authentic or not, and the political de-radicalization of queer and trans movements. So I'd argue that there's no real contradiction, in fact, between the narrow and apolitical framing of an expanded and inclusive LGBT rights and an LGBT community, and the eviction of that same imagined community's most radical members and urgent political demands. It's not simply that 
um, these sort of gestures that expanded inclusivity, including like, you know, a nod to like racism and anti-racism or to intersex community or to trans community. It's not simply that these um, additions to the pride flag, for example, um, are, are, are attempts to pander to marginalized communities or to acknowledge those communities, but that, um, but, but that the notion that, that these groups can be represented and let alone represented in this way um, is part of the process of actually undercutting some of their more material urgent needs. And, and this is not to say that, you know, all of these things are done by flags um, <laughs> or even necessarily consciously done by like nonprofit um, pride organizations. Um, but that I think this is like a, a function of, um, you know, the, the, the liberalization of radical movements when, when demands shift from decriminalization um, and resistance to exploitation and imperialism to um, property ownership um, and recognition as um, a viable queer market. Um, a lot of words, <laughs> what can you do? I'm gonna push on. Uh, I hope this makes more sense as I continue. Um, so, as Jasbir Puar notes, the argument that nationalist and capitalist entities are co-opting queer struggle presupposes an inherent contradiction between queerness and capitalism or nationalism that I'd argue in the 21st century no longer really exists, um, at least for those members of the community that have achieved their racial and class aspirations. Um, and I think there's, there's a couple strong examples of this. Um, one is that you can point to even the developments of um, what I'll call a gay rights movement um, in New York, in the United States, in the 20th century. Um, like from the jump, a lot of the uh, activists involved with that and organizing on that front, um, we're doing so with an emphasis on decriminalization of sex work and the reduction of poverty, de-arresting people. Um, there's a very famous speech that uh, Sylvia Rivera, um, who's a, a Puerto Rican uh, anti-imperialist communist, um, made at, um, uh, I forget the actual name of the thing. It was, it was, a, a, it was a, a large public meeting of, of uh, uh, gay organizers and, and activists, but I forget the actual name of the event. Um, that was, you know, like pushing to the front of the stage and imploring people to care about um, her sisters that were in jail, that were being uh, attacked and, and imprisoned and attacked. Um, I won't get into the too much of the actual like drama of it, but, but at that time and, and in that context, there was uh, a lot of like infighting within the, the community after I wrote, um, the Atlantic article, um, someone who was apparently a Stonewall veteran uh, sent me an email very mad about it. Um, so that infighting is continuing even after people's deaths um, uh, about how, um, you know, the, uh, the, the more appropriate route towards uh, gay power um, is by sort of discarding these uh, less desirable elements of the community, abandoning um, these more broadly based um, anti-imperial and anti-police demands um, and embracing an emphasis on like gay power specifically. Um, over time, what that's meant really um, is the gay power to own property. Um, and I'm based in Toronto and Canada. Um, there's, uh, I had a chance to do like a, a, a bit of an oral history um, uh, of the village here. And as um, there emerged a largely white property owning class of gay people, um, their relationship with the police shifted from one of um, uh, uh, basically being preyed upon by the police um, to relying on the police to um, keep the peace um, in terms of like the, the, uh, the public space um, to, to move homeless people and sex workers, um, including um, people of color, especially um, and trans women um, out of the village that was going to be become that was going to be turned into a business improvement zone. Similar things are happening in New York. There's a, a really good uh, part of this book by um, David Valentine called uh, uh, I think it's Imagine Transgender um, and Ethnography of a Category that talks about this. There's a couple incidents of it where the people were were like literally protesting against each other, um, and in ways that are clearly divisible by um, uh, gender and racial or class lines. Um, 
my point here is not, you know, to sort of like repeat the kind of like, you know, like, like, the, you know, like the, the category of like a, like a cis gay man that like we're all supposed to hate. I mean, if you do, that's fine. But, um, but, but to, to the point that there are actually like very real differences in terms of like this sort of imagined LGBT community that come down to um, our relationship to the accumulation of capital, who can get it and what they do with it. Um, some people are unable to do so. Um, and a point that I really want to make is that um, the accumulation of capital necessarily relies upon um, the maintenance of a hyper exploitable, largely criminalized population. Um, so, it's, you know, returning to the Coca Cola example, it's easy to point at, you know, pride friendly advertisements and say something to the effect of this brand doesn't care about, bu- about gay people, so this is all bullshit. But that'd be wrong because the brand does care about gay people, at least, you know, in the narrow way it understands gayness because they're a relevant market share. You know, there are probably members of Coca-Cola's own internal workforce who are gay and some, you know, ostensible support for LGBT people is considered a progressive prerequisite. What's being erased here or papered over is not the supposedly anti-queer politics of a particular brand, but the anti-capitalist politics of the historical queer movement. Um, for which a brand like Coca-Cola represents not simply a site of authentic or inauthentic gay inclusion, but an agent of monstrous abuses against the global South. So the issue is not whether or not a brand cares about LGBT people in the imperial core enough to hire them and treat them well, but rather whether or not it cares about, say, fair and just labor laws in Haiti, Indonesia, and the Philippines, which it doesn't. In considering this issue, then we might do well to ask what kinds of bodies and lives are a race in the production of our visibility or inclusion. Um, My point is that we we cannot disappear the crucial element of criminalization in in capitalist exploitation. Um, So to limit our analysis to the authenticity or inauthenticity of certain gestures, whether they be at the hands of corporations or politicians or through pride flags, is to inadvertently reify the idea of an LGBT community that exists independently of its relationship to capitalism, or even of a kind of post-capitalist politics. And no such thing can really exist. Um, We risk invisibilizing the invisible hand of the market um, by, by framing the problem only in terms of what these brands do for queers rather than in terms of how the brand advances its interest in the capitalist system. You know, we, we mistakenly reaffirm the idea of a queer market constituency that has to be appealed to correctly. Um, when the issue is really whether or not such a thing actually can or should be said to exist. Um, and the fact that this entity is now a, a or the, this imagined community, the LGBT community um, is conjured up so as to be a, market constituency rather than an agitatory group. Um, So we have this, you know, rambling umbrella, um, this wonderful acronym, but what are we doing with it? And which is, which is, I think, part of why, um, at least on the internet, you encounter a lot of people who are um, very invested in the idea of their belonging to a community um, without much discussion of what that actually means. Um, what that community entails or what that belonging means. Um, There's a lot of discussion of, you know, an LGBT space. What is an LGBT space? What do you do there? Um, And who belongs in there? Um, In her book, uh, uh, Sex Change, Social Change, Vivian Namaste um, brings up the the idea of a a trans police officer um, and argues that the very existence of a trans police officer is dependent upon trans people's systemic criminalization, the policing of poverty, sex work, and public morality. Um, so that argument that the very possibility of inclusion and representation rests upon a highly constrained and constructed rendition of the community to be included and represented. Um, and I'd argue that in that framework, um, the emergence of certain highly visible, exceptionally successful individuals as a representative class of LGBTQ people, I think this is particularly true and I can say it for non-binary people, for, for certain trans people, um, uh, works to a race even as it requires a criminalized underclass. And that underclass is overwhelmingly trans, sex working, black, migrant, disabled, et cetera. Um, the very possibility of representing an ostensibly radical LGBTQ identity through capitalism requires obliterating queer and trans radicalism. Um, and, and it's grim to say that. Um, but but I, I, I think we're... <laughs> Um, 
I, I, I think I think a similar theme is is maybe uh, consistent when we think about pink washing. It, it's the the issue is not that you know, I, and Israel is the perfect example. Um, you know that that uses a sort of the idea of of um, being like a, a a beacon of queer rights in the barbaric Middle East. Um, the more inclusive and representative and palatable or palatable, I don't know. I'm not that bright. Um, <laughs> the more expansive and inclusive and seemingly representative of an LGBTQ community there can appear to exist in the West or in its colonial outposts um, in Occupy Palestine, for example, the more effective it is as a foil against the quote unquote sort of barbaric Orient. Um, and there's a, an easy comparison to make with the role of white women in earlier stages of colonialism um, in discourses of imperial occupation and invasion even recently. Um, and even, um, and I, I don't mean this in, uh, to be shady in any way, but, but even to, to talk about, you know, uh, Russia as a particular villain because of its treatment of LGBTQ people, which is true. Like, like this is not to deny that these, these violences exist, but that they also occupy a very particular discursive role. And so the, the question then should be, instead of how can we um, defend the rights of LGBT people in Russia, it's how do we as politicized queer and trans people uh, 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 form and strengthen an anti-war movement. Um, we're not disregarding these concerns, but we're fitting them into a context that, that is mindful of what I argue is, is the principal contradiction here. And, and, and now I'm, I'm borrowing a turn of phrase from Mao and um, because I think it's very effective, you know, uh, uh, to understand something, we have to understand the, the contradictions, principal and secondary. Um, and I think it, it's a, a, a frequent trend um, in gay or you know queer politics, um, to ignore the principal contradictions, or, or or just to not necessarily like recognize them as principal that have to do with capitalism and empire. Um, I I don't think that this sort of appeal to gay rights is is um, necessarily like functional for all audiences. Obviously, like certainly not in the way that you know the the elevating the status of white women um, has historically been. Um, you know, it, it lacks that kind of broad sticking power, but it does have some effects. Um, and you consider, uh, I don't know, the, the trans military ban, for example, um, which in itself, you know, activism around it reaffirms the idea of the military as a key institutional employer or a tool for class mobility, uh, a, a part of life, as opposed to recognizing it for what it is, which is um, a fantastically overfunded institution for terrorizing half of the world. Um, and maintaining, you know, networks of extraction and exploitation that map out pretty closely to a global color line. Um, when we focus on, you know, inclusion with respect to that, we're missing that principal contradiction, um, that, that fundamental um, racial and class antagonism that divides the world. Um, and so this is something that I don't know what I'm doing for time. Um, <laughs> this is something that uh, uh, came up when I was working on that article um, having to do with, um, uh, uh, and, and something that, that comes up, you know, in, in my life as in the institutions where I um, work and learn um, uh, that has to do with um, uh, actually like political efforts. Um, within sort of LGBT organizations. Uh, folks that I talked to for that article um, were talking about, you know, we love that all these like queer events exist during Pride, but um, it's very difficult to feel like we can participate in them because um, there are weapons manufacturers that are sponsors. Um, I go to a, a, a school, or at least I, I, I went to a school where, um, um, the Asset Man Management Corporation um, was heavily invested um, in uh, uh, Hewlett Packard, um, which is involved in, um, you know, providing uh, technology to maintain occupation checkpoints in Occupy Palestine. Um, uh, in, in previous years, um, uh, activists had discovered that, that there were investments in uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, which is a weapons manufacturer. Um, I think Raytheon, is a, uh, which is also a weapons manufacturer, um, is involved in like, a, I think it was Salt Lake City uh, Pride. Um, this was in an initial draft of that Atlantic article, but it might've been edited out. Um, I, 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 I think this is, um, you know, this is, this is a similar kind of 
process as, um, yeah, this is as a similar kind of process as what I'm trying to identify um, at various levels um, in a sense that um, the more we sort of buy into the idea of our own representability, um, that there are some people who are or are not deserving of representation. This is what it looks like. This is what a coherent queer community or constituency looks like. We end up papering, o papering over these divisions, um, which are not merely aesthetic um, or existing at the level of identity or affiliation, but have to do with significant issues of material oppression, um, criminalization and exploitation. And I think the uh, answer to that is to form um, a stronger anti-war movement and anti-capitalist movement. Um, and I'm going to end on that note. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Alex. I think that uh, you raise questions that are tough, but very important for us to think about really important questions. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, all right, uh, moving on. Uh, and again, showing the sort of great variety and sort of things coming into this forum. Um, next, we have Liz Collins, a once RISD based, now New York City based textile artist whose work has been exhibited in numerous places, including at the ICA Boston, the Tang Museum in Sarasota Springs, the Knoxville Museum of, of Art, the Fashion Institute of Technology, Museum of Arts and Design, Leslie Lowell Museum, and MoMA. Among her many amazing projects is one created around the pride flag, uh, which she'll talk to us about now in her presentation called Feelings into Form, the Life of a Giant Knit Rainbow Flag. So uh, welcome, Liz. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you, Lynn, and everyone who organized this panel. And it's great to hear you panelists already. Um, I am going to share my screen. All right. Oh, wait a second. Stop share. I have to do it differently. I just remembered something. One second. Okay. So um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to share with you in the next 10 to 15 minutes about this project I did um, initially in um, 2008 that had a much bigger life. So um, I'm going to read this quote about the genesis of the project. Wait, I have to move my, there we go. Um, and this is a quote from Catherine Lord that she wrote in the book Art and Queer Culture that she and Kath, uh, Richard Meyer edited and first came out in 2013 and featured my Knitting Nation phase four pride project um, and the opposing page is Isaac Julian's work. So that was a ginormous thrill for me to be neighbors with Isaac Julian because I'm such a fan. Knitting Nation founded in 2005 is the project of fashion designer and textile artist Liz Collins who deploys knitting machines, site specific installation, performance and a small army of collaborators to manufacture comments on the interaction of humans and machines. On the 40th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, Collins and her workers reconstructed the gay pride flag designed in 1978 by Gilbert Baker. The original rainbow flag intended to represent the diversity of the gay community featured eight colors representing ideals such as healing, nature, spirit, and life. Among the original colors were hot pink and turquoise representing sex and art. As the rainbow flag evolved into a marketing opportunity, sex and art were somehow deleted from the rainbow. Knitting Nation Phase 4 Pride restores these ideals to queer consciousness, theatricalizing their disappearance from community ideals and proclaiming the necessity of their presence. So um, a little backstory on Knitting Nation, just briefly, this was the second flag I decided to tackle. Um, and the fourth phase of the project that started with um, Wait, sorry, where am, why am I not? Oh, okay. Knitting Nation phase one in 2005, um, where I tackled the American flag as the first version of this project that 
I thought was a one-off, but then turned into something very generative for me, um, as described in that prior slide by Catherine Lord, just did all kinds of things with lots of layers um, of humans and machines and political issues. And then to add to that textile manufacturing, which was my background, textile and apparel manufacturing. Um, so it was, it, it became this very generative project for me. And I did subsequent iterations having certain fixed elements of these knit, machine knitters in uniform um, and um, making large scale site specific textile um, durational performance installations. Um, why is my, sorry, I don't know why. Oh, okay. So this is a video that another artist who was, is one of my peers from the kind of knit activism period um, and continues to be a dear friend, Sabrina Geschwantner, she made a video um, featuring my project, um, the Knitting Nation Pride project alongside a couple others. So I'm just gonna play you part of this video and then another video that I made about this event. And what you'll see, is, you'll hear a lot of noise. The point of this project was to have a kind of cacophony, um, but also what you'll hear is some reading and what is being read was um, replies, replies from an online poll that I conducted um, asking people how they felt about the rainbow flag as a symbol of gay pride and why. So I have orators kind of rotating um, positions while this production of the flag is going on, um, reading the replies. So those are, it's, they're amazing um, replies from all over the world, people saying all different things about how they feel about the rainbow flag. Sentimentally remember when I felt so queer and part of the subculture that I felt sanctioned by buying and proudly wearing all the rainbow and pink triangle merchandise. never gave the flag much more thought than, oh, the queer flag. Until recently, where they were filming the film Milk here. As it goes, back in 1978, a few months before the Moscone Milk murders, the rainbow flag was first unfurled. This happened at San Francisco's Gay Pride, 1978, here in San Francisco. Gilbert Baker basically sewed the entire thing and was rolled up and stored on the landing of the mayor's office, which looked out over UN Plaza Way in City Hall. Below the landing was the stage where the names were having their microphone time to gave pride. Finally up to the microphone comes supervisor Harvey Milk. He gives, by all accounts, a tremendously rousing speech. As he finishes, the times on the flag were cut, and behind, behind Harvey, the flag is unfurled in its first public debut. When Sam Sant created this for the movie, I got to witness this debut, albeit secondhand, and it was brilliant. It changed my feeling about the flag one million percent. Contact is everything. 
spring looks like it was a little outdated and chilly. And I like that. The outdatedness gives a sense of history. Okay. And then we have this video. As a straight person who loves my gay, bi, les, trans, and I must confess, I wish that a different flag be adopted. I have been in love with rainbows, the physical phenomena, since I was five, and cannot express that love visually through tattoos or other visual expression without first putting it through a filter to make sure I would not be misrepresenting myself as gay. I saw a comedian who had a line. I think it's interesting that one group of people took refracted light. I think about, I think about, think about it, gay people, kind of selfish. I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way. I just love rainbows and would love to be able to freely use them as a symbol. I think homosexual people are equal on all levels and are just awesome people. I just don't get why rainbows represent homosexuality. What, diversity? Multifaceted? Where did it come from? And I just think everyone should get to use rainbows just like everyone gets to use the beach and the ocean. at the moment. Our daughter just came out this year and we want to support her as much as possible, but being older parents, we remember the way it was and are sometimes afraid for her. I was sitting here tonight thinking about buying a rainbow flag to fly from the deck when she's home from school, but there was always that small undercurrent of fear. I wish it wasn't so. I wish we could just plaster the whole house with rainbow flags and no one would even bat an eye. But there is always that one person. The rainbow flag is colorful, happy, welcoming, and fun. It's no coincidence that those words also happen to describe most of the gay people I know, myself included. I think it's a great symbol for gay pride, and although I feel no need to wrap myself in it, I smile every time I see it. I don't want to drive you all too crazy with that noise, but the noise was, it's part of the point of the project and, um, you know, gives people a sense of what textile factories are like. So here are some stills from the project. This was at Water Place Park. So it'll be familiar to those of you who are living or have lived in Providence. Um, I proposed this and, you know, small cities are great in that when you propose big art projects, you often can just do them. <laughs> At the time, it really was nice because I just contacted the Arts and Culture Commissioner at the mayor's office and they were very excited about it and helped me fund it. And um, it just came together in a really beautiful way. I was teaching, I was on the faculty of the textiles department at RISD at the time and which was part of the impetus for starting Knitting Nation in the first place, because I was in this room full of people working on knitting machines who were excited about knitting like I was. And um, it just seemed like a smart way to form an army um, and make something collectively. So this poll and this kind of cacophonous multimedia experience that Knitting Nation phase four was, um, people really got excited about and 
you know, like, like I mentioned before about the Knitting Nation project, it was extremely generative for me. Um, and, uh, you know, in the kind of in hindsight, it fell into a, uh, uh, many iterations. I did um, 15 iterations of Knitting Nation over 11 years, and I'll show a couple of those. So what I wanted to bring forward from this piece is that, um, after the project, I, at this point in the project in Knitting Nation, I was still thinking of the event as the work, as the piece. At, but with this project, we, you see it rolled up here and we carried it down to AS220 and hung it on the building. You can see a picture of that on my website. I don't have it here. But, um, and, and then we dropped it at the end of the night and then it was a blob on the sidewalk. And it was at that moment that I started to realize I was making an object too that was something. And so I, uh, it, this piece was really a catalyst for me to start working more um, in kind of static installations. And so I started playing with the piece and installing it in different ways in different places as the years went by. And I also repurposed it um, in other Knitting Nation installations. So you can see on the right, the kind of rainbow colored blob on the floor um, at the ICA Boston. So I started using it in, in subsequent Knitting Nation installations where I was invited to create sets um, instead of starting a piece from scratch, which I was really purist about doing initially. And then it moved into being a kind of a set prop. And then I started, I, I, I decided I wanted to bring it to a parade. Um, so this is a dike march in 2014, and I didn't know who was going to help me carry it. I showed up with it there, pushing it in a stroller and slowly recruited people to carry it. So by the end, every, a bunch of people were carrying it. Um, lots of hot dykes who I was excited to see touching my artwork. And, um, you know, everyone kind of rallied at the end to roll it up and um, send me away with it. And um, it was just... Like it, it just kept accumulating more meaning and more experience. Then I was invited to do, um, to be in an exhibition at Leslie Lohman Museum in New York, which is the only gay, lesbian, queer museum in the country. And um, so it was in the show called Queer Threads that then went on to Baltimore um, and then it traveled one other place. And so I kept kind of reinstalling it then I decided to give it to Leslie Lohman because, you know, when you're an artist and you make large artworks and they stay with you, then you have to store them. And I decided to give the whole thing. And Sabrina gave the video piece that she shot um, and the banners and everything. So now it's in the collection of the Leslie Lohman Museum. So um, the next few slides show Knitting Nation's presence in some important books. Um, that are textile related, fashion related, art, you know, fiber art related books. Um, people really appreciated this project. And um, so I wanted to kind of show, oh, is that, my, is my slideshow over already? Oh my God, how did that happen? It just ended. <laughs> I guess the video was really the, the big part of it and it's been 15 minutes and 58 seconds. So. Um, I think that's it for me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Liz. It's it's uh, wonderful to see uh, those images. So thank you. Um, I also, uh, before I introduce our last, but certainly not least panelists, I do want to again, remind people that we are accumulating questions um, or if you have comments to put those in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window so that we can get right to those um, after uh, our last panelist. Um, so like I said, last but certainly not least um, is Yvonne Ramos, who uh, very lucky for us has recently joined the Department of Theater, uh, Theater Arts and Performance Studies here at Brown having previously been an assistant professor in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. His book, Sonic Negations, 
unbelonging subjects, inauthentic objects, and sound between Mexico and the United States is forthcoming from NYU Press. So we can all look for that. Uh, but his presentation today here is called Drowning in a Sea of Pride Flags in parentheses. So thank you so much, Yvonne. All right, thank you. And I want to thank uh, the Pembroke and Lynn for this invitation as well as Diane uh, and all of the people who um, have helped administratively. So I'm going to start just with a brief clip. And this is from uh, the recent Sex and City Revival. Revolution. You're a part of the evolution. We know that visibility is not justice. But visibility can be the key that unlocks it all, y'all. OK. I want to thank you all for living in your truth today, for saying, fuck this rain bullshit, and being here for each other. I mean, y'all are making me wet. And I want to thank our LGBTQ plus allies. You okay, darling? Oh, I'm sorry. Live your truth. You have nothing to hide. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you know what? Hiding is like so five years ago. Right, I wanted to end on that note. Um, I can't. Um, at the beginning of episode eight of the recent reboot of Sex and the City, and just like that, Miranda, played by Cynthia Nixon, watches on as her new non-binary love interest, Che Diaz, played by Sara Ramirez, does a stand-up set in what we can surmise um, from the flags around that is some sort of pride event. As Che thinks the allies present at the rally, Miranda spots her son Brady and his girlfriend. Um, still closeted to them. Uh, she runs away in horror, making her way past the sea of pride flags in various forms, from the flags themselves to the adaptation in clothing and other paraphernalia. Um, I first watched the scene knowing that I would be giving this short talk and undecided at the time on what exactly I would be talking about. I couldn't help but be struck not only by the sheer amount of pride imagery, um, but also by the show's attempt to include every possible contemporary iteration of a growing number of pride flags, which over the last few years have become one of the primary symbols, but which uh, seemed a seemingly and newly publicly visible sexual and gender identifications have tried to affirm themselves. And I, I want to talk about today that uh, about that today in relation to my own moment of identification with Miranda's reaction, by which I mean, even though I have never escaped a pride celebration in closeted horror after seeing my teenage son not being closeted or having any children, I couldn't help but feel hailed by the fact that whenever I find myself surrounded by such a cheery spirit of pride and its flags, I often feel like running away in horror. So in my brief remarks today, I want to think through a couple of things in relation to that scene. First, my own history coming generationally from a queer politics that embraced the idea of shame as a corrective opposite to the increasing corporatization of pride, as well as LGBTQ plus identities. And second, and how just like that deployment of pride is indicative of the show's attempts to signal its newly progressive, perhaps you could call it woke, uh, politics through the figure of Che Diaz. However, rather than just offer a critique of the character and the show's attempt to diversify its extremely white and heterosexual past, I turned to Che Diaz to discuss how I came to embrace a character that many have called the most annoying on television, but who in their awfulness perhaps also allows me to reframe and potentially embrace the sense of horror and embarrassment of the ever-growing specter of pride as a defining marker of difference. Part one grounding in a sea of pride flags. I was 16 the first time I visited Hillcrest, the neighborhood in San Diego. And myself and a few friends skipped school in Tijuana and furtively drove across the border to make our pilgrimage. At first, I felt an inevitable wave of excitement as I looked out to witness pride flags everywhere, caught in the thrill that here for the first time, I had found myself over the rainbow and in the promised land of an openly gay world. As we walk down, the street in of a place where everyone and everything seemed gay. 
we stumbled upon Obelisk, a gay bookstore, which at the time, it has since burned down sadly, but in at the time, in addition to the usual bright knickknacks, also had a robust queer theory section, where I would end up spending considerable amount of time over the next few years, especially during my time as a student in a community college just a few minutes away. I bring this up because after that initial excitement, my immediate obsession with queer theory and its critiques, um, especially at the time, meant finding a vocabulary that challenged the narrative of forward progress and inclusion that the pride flag exemplified as the horrors of the AIDS crisis morphed in what would become the more or less mainstream acceptance of gays and lesbians um, and gay marriage and the corporatization of gay pride. So I came into queer theory or perhaps something we can call queerness itself in the time of shame. What I mean by this is that during these formative years, shame had become an operational concept that specifically sought to pro protest the assimilative thrust of the gay rights movement. For example, in San Francisco, um, the activist collective gay shame announced itself as a virus in the system and they carried out performative protests against San Francisco's increasingly corporatized pride festivities. Um, and there uh, are some of the stickers. The, 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 here they are interrupting pride itself, the pride festival. Uh, and they mounted a lot of really wonderful campaigns against uh, the kind of techie explosion in San Francisco. In the academic realm, works like gay shame aim to do the same, contesting what many, including myself, saw an increasingly politicized gay movement trade the radical potentialities of a queer life in favor of cultural and political assimilation. And this came out of a conference at the University of Michigan. Uh, and it's a great anthology. And of course, it's uh, the great performance artist, Ron Athey on the cover. And I'm also actually thinking of uh, the great Sylvan Pumpkins reader edited by Eve Sedgwick and Andrew Parker, uh, Shame and its Sisters, um, which I think sets, helps set just how much shame at that point was part of both the kind of public alternative and the intellectual discussion. I think I found myself so drawn to this queer theory and this queer orientation toward the world because here was a way of thinking and living that captured my own orientation toward unbelonging. And in fact, it drew me in so completely that in the midst of toiling for a few years in community college, struggling to figure out what exactly I wanted to do, I decided that what I actually wanted to do was write and teach about queerness and queer theory for the rest of my life, no matter how far away that possibility seemed for someone who knew nothing about how to exactly get there. Uh, part two, I learned to stop worrying and love shape Diaz. And so I'll return to that. Um, if, okay, am I screen still being shared? Um, all right, I'll return to that. Um, and then for those of you who may have missed it, I just show some of these slides again really quickly. Um, gay shame and marriage. Um, and then again, like here are some of the stickers um, and the book again with Ron Athey on the cover and one of his performances of uh, Solar Anus. Um, so part two, how he learned to stop worrying and love Che Diaz. Um, recently I asked students in my queer aesthetics graduate seminar, are people ashamed to be gay anymore? It was an honest question sparked by my years teaching LGBT studies and moving across queer culture, where I saw a new generation of young people across the LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus spectrum not only embrace belonging, but also a mainstream where positive representations became a central element of the experience of sexual and gender difference. After all, this new generation had witnessed, if they had even been born, a landscape where marriage, family, and social acceptance were not only possible, but perhaps even expected. These cultural shifts were motivated in many ways by an idea that the main goal of LGBTQ plus politics and culture was to bring up queer and gender nonconforming children in a world without the kind of homophobia um, and in the present transphobia that many of us have grown up with and were even convinced was normal. And alongside these changes also came other claims to identity from the so-called trans tipping point that has brought trans people to the fourth political and cultural realm, as well as other identifications ranging from non-binary to the asexual, spe asexual spectrum with many stops in between. Alongside these changes, the need to update or create entirely new pride flags came along with them. 
This in large part, of course, because people have kept finding new terms and languages to capture the specificities of their identifications. So has the sense that all of these new coming outs can and should be followed by the embrace of pride and its many flags. And I must admit, at first I find my attachment to gay shame uh, couldn't help but make me wary of such a turn, the sense that one's relationship to identity must be pride and disability. And so, Chadius, when the character made their debut in the first episode of And Just Like That as the host of a podcast alongside Sarah Jessica Parker's protagonist, Gary Bradshaw, Viewers immediately understood that their inclusion was one of the show's ways to signal its newly progressive outlook, in part because Che served as the mouthpiece for a new and potentially unwieldy woke generation. The fact that Che was also Latinx, one of the reboot's many attempts to include the characters of color that had been missing from the original Sex in the City, couldn't help but feel a bit misguided at best, potentially cynical at worst. But these attempts couldn't help but fail not only because of the show's inability to actually engage with any sort of difference, but also because Che Diaz is, well, very annoying. Indeed, the character was tasked with delivering sippy one-liners and hackneyed comedy routines armed with a woke movement button for their podcast, in addition to providing the main romantic storyline for Miranda, culminating in Che's cringe for the rendition of California Girls in a club full of friends and even Che's abuelitas to announce that they're moving to Los Angeles to pursue a TV pilot. And I'll just show you a couple of things. Um, and we get the sense throughout the season that Che is immensely popular and perhaps even a mouthpiece for the LGBTQ plus community. Much to the horror and re of recappers and fans of Miranda, the former corporate attorney chooses to join Che in Los Angeles, especially after the latter has confidently admitted to Miranda, I'm just a fucking narcissist. But something surprising happened with Che Diaz after the final episode they vetoed on HBO Max, we realized that we could not get enough of them. They made us cringe for sure, but then more and more tweets and memes featuring Che kept popping up. An article in Vulture announced Che's departure from the podcast with deadpan seriousness. And um, here's a few more uh, from the revising of the Hollywood sign to Che Diaz to a Che Diaz appearance in, um, uh, Cynthia Nixon's other series, which could be like the gay series on TV right now, The Gilded Age, to Che Diaz as the equally uh, meme-rific uh, green M&M. And of course, uh, one of my favorite tweets, uh, Che Diaz has set back the LGBT rights 20 years. Um, and so I began to wonder um, if in the span of those 10 episodes, Che Diaz had become the unlikely protagonist of the series, even if antagonistically. This is because for all their cringe, I couldn't help but get the sense that we are all Che Diaz, by which I mean that perhaps they had allowed us to recognize the narcissistic part of us that wants to embrace the possibility of being proud and boisterous, freed from shame, free to deliver bad quips about our identities, to have woke moments, to be annoying, to be ourselves, to smirk with abandon as we carry these endlessly multiplying flags and to be a fucking narcissist through it all. I'll be honest, I'm not completely sure that I will ever happily return to the bright festivities I've avoided for years. And in fact, I know that the next time I find myself surrounded by a sea of pride flags, it might turn out that I will still run away with horror as Miranda did. I might be too old to ever embrace my inner Che. But there's also the part of me that understands that as the tides of identity continue to change and expand, there's little use in seeking to resist them, even if I can help but remain critical. But as my students continue to show me, my naturally cranky disposition can and must also attempt to learn and welcome what can become possible in this new world. One draped in the pride flags that I can only hope will be carried in the name of the battles we have won, and as new anti-trans legislations insidiously grow across the country, those battles that we have yet to win. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And again, thank you to uh, to everybody who presented. Um, I think that. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting uh, issues on the table that would be great for us to talk about. 
So again, I'm inviting everybody. So again, a round of applause to everyone. Um, and I'm inviting uh, people, again, if you have questions, comments, to put them in the Q&A uh, tab uh, so that we can get to them. Um, I'd like to start actually asking a, a question, you know, sort of putting people in dialogue with one another, um, if possible, and and asking what I, I think is a complicated question, which is in some ways, you know, the question of citizenship that goes along with the very notion of, of flags and, you know, what do we think about that? So obviously that came up in very, very different ways, I think, across some of the different panels. So even, you know, for example, Liz's project being named Knitting Nation, right? And what does it mean to kind of take that language of nation and the citizenship that it can suggest or, or maybe redeploy in a different way? But then there are also, of course, you know, the, the troubling sort of nationalistic notions of it that I think that in many ways Alex and Yvonne uh, presentation sort of got to is there a way in which in thinking in these terms, you know, we're already defining the limits of, of what queer possibilities can be, a queer world can be to, you know, certain ways of thinking that are already sort of indebted to imperialist modes, capitalist modes, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's it's a tough question and I would love to know, I mean, I realize that, like I said, they came up in very different ways, you know, between the personal people's feelings about the flags and when they feel like they belong or not belong to, you know, an imaginary country, you know, the feelings of like to kind of, again, creative redeployments of that to, you know, political kind of issues around it. And I'll also even relate it to Michelle's, like Michelle, you were talking uh, about, and, and I think that again, Liz talked about this, about the interaction of humans and machines, right? And, and Michelle, you talked about, again, the way even MoMA was designed around the machine, but is there a way in which, you know, pride and the flags get swallowed into the machinery of, you know, again, capitalism, nationalism, et cetera, um, or is it an important kind of, again, re-articulation? So I just love to know what, what folks think about that. Well, I'm gonna say something first because you mentioned the nation thing. So I'll just jump right in. I mean, there's so much to say and everyone's so brilliant. So what do we do? Um, I named the project Knitting Nation um, partly after a Janet Jackson song, the Rhythm Nation or the, the album Rhythm Nation. Um, it just, it felt like the right thing at the time, at that time, which it was a very different time from now. It was before people knew ab about the harsh realities of factories. Like it was before the Bangladesh thing happened where the factory collapsed on all the textile workers. It was like, I was, do I started doing that project at a time when people did not understand that humans were making fabric and clothing to the degree that people do now. Yeah. And people have caught up, like, you know, food was like 15 years ahead of, of textiles. Like we get it now more. And that's part of why I don't do the project anymore because there is a didactic aspect to it and a laying bare of this grueling labor that is so common to so many of these things. So it was kind of a like a way to kind of unify and talk about solidarity of, of workers. And just to be clear, I was always one of the workers um, and the workers were paid. Um, so there's that. And I'll, I'll leave the other comments to everybody else. <laughs> Would any of the other panelists like to comment on that? And I see too, I'll just note that even as I was asking that, I'm looking now at the questions and I see that Kelsey, uh, one of our guests at this, asked a very similar question about how the purpose and nature of being represented by a flag ties into nationalism. So I think that, again, that's quite tied to the question I asked. So what, what do other folks, any, anyone else on the panel interested in 
given their thoughts about that? I mean, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, it's it's incredibly complicated on a couple of issues, right? On the one hand, uh, I narrate that moment of crossing across the border, and part of the reason why I moved to the States instead of stayed in Mexico was precisely uh, this concept that I think sociologists use a little bit more called sexual citizenship, right? In the sense that whatever form of gay life or queer life I could imagine for myself was much easier in a place where those flags could be visible. Sure, you knew that was part of it. And at the same time, you know, um, I can't help, uh, you know, but agree, especially with Alex's point, right, of the ways in which like the pride flag becomes almost superimposed over, you know, imperialist regimes in order to signal that. And and so, you know, I think that's, that's the kind of, ambivalence of it, right? That even, even in, a, in a context in which I'm traveling, of course the flag, I, I still see a flag out of a business, right? And I feel that immediate sense of like, okay, I'm okay in there, right? I can walk in and not be worried, especially in you know a conservative area or a place where that facility may not exist. And at the same time, I mean, the fact that it being, that it's so divisible and co-optable is, you know, how to put this, a feature, not a bug. And I mean, but you know, that is precisely the kind of imbalance that we all live with, even with these new flags. And as much as I respect what they represent, there's a part of me that's like, well, you know, like, do we need another flag? Yeah, Alex, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think these are um, interesting contributions. Uh, the one sort of like spin I put on this, um, is I think it, it, I wish there was a way to think about belonging without thinking about citizenship, um, which is, I think like maybe just like more of a provocation than like a real answer. Like, and I'll fully like seed that. Like, I just, um, uh, I, I think unfortunately there's, there's a kind of like methodological nationalism that has like made it very difficult to like, um, actually like get outside of that kind of framework. Um, which is why, like, even, like, to think it was, like, oh, like, I hadn't thought about, like, a nation as something, like, as, like, meaning something um, other than, like, you know, the reference or the sense of people coming together, because, you know, why would you? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't even mean that in, like, a, I don't mean that in any kind of critical way um, towards my colleague. Like, I, I think it, it's a completely reasonable slippage, um, uh, which is also, like, this in the same way that, like, that kind of question is being asked. Like, I, I don't know, actually, if we have the capacity to think about belonging outside of citizenship, which is maybe why flags are so resonant. And like the idea of like, you know, just like making additions to and playing with flags, like feels really resonant for people. I mean, I will say like the, the fact that there's also such a variety of flags and such a uh, uh, such a true like proliferation and specificity of them, like corresponding to like so many micro identities. I don't know if anyone here has been on Tumblr at any point in the last like five, 10 years, but like it's, uh, it's wacky out there. Um, but like, uh, there's a real strong, um, you know, classificatory impulse. And if I was like willing to be like a bit like more pointed with it, like I like attribute that wholly to colonialism. I don't know if that's entirely true or fair, but like, but I do, <laughs> but I, I do think, um, you know, like that there, there's a reason why, um, the idea of cit belonging as citizenship, um, and as and wanting to display a kind of membership um, is so resonant for people. And I think even part of that is like because um, for a, a long time a specific argument that had been advanced um, in the context of anti-communism, like during the Red Scare, is that um, you know gay people were a security threat because they're they're kind of invisible villain and they can be blackmailed potentially. So they're always like compromised, which is like sort of resulted in, in significant purges of, of queer people from public service in Canada. Um, and is actually a thing that is done by the Israeli military to Palestinians, like the, the, the blackmailing of queer Palestinians. So I, I think there actually is, I don't know, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna like really overread it, like I think there's a possibility that there's a desire to be part of something um, that is perhaps a reaction to that um, as much as it is sort of spurred on by other things. Um, but I, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not married to any of these points. Like I'm sort of riffing on a theme. Yeah. But I think that they're great questions. I mean, how can we think belonging beyond citizenship? We could also say, how can we think citizenship beyond nationalism that it could have different meetings? How can we think of 
nations beyond that having to mean state, states and imperialism? Like, are there ways to rearticulate all of these terms? And and I, you know, I I do agree and 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 think that it's important, like you, you were saying, Alex, to think about where do some of these come from? The kind of identif identifiableness, identificatory regimes being tied to colonialism and certainly of course being tied to consumer and commodity culture where you know in a way the more specific identities that can be recognized the more that they can be branded and made into a market share so you know we're in these situations and how do we both i mean but those the how do we try to rethink them in different ways um i think that some of those issues about again the kind of identifications tied to a couple other questions that we've gotten. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna sort of combine two that I think are are very tied to things that that just came up in people's answers about again, especially about the proliferation of different flags or the changing the changing of the pride flag to either pro proliferate on the design itself, like add stripes or add a chevron or add a symbol or just come up with different flags. So. One question that we received from uh, Bill uh, Barnett, I think I'm getting that right, but I might be wrong, sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing, that really wanted to talk about in some ways that, you know, by trying to be inclusive, adding more colors or chevrons or stripes in some ways, you know, do, does it have the unintended consequences of actually excluding in the specific example in Bill's question would be, for example, the bisexual community getting, you know, that if you add on different things, then are we, you know, what does it then mean for those who don't get another stripe added on? Is that, you know, omitting? And then, and then Bill had some very interesting ideas about other ways that the flag could be designed. Uh, it also ties to a question from another person who didn't give their name that says, from their perspective, flags can be an attempt to rally around or under, uh, you know, in order to pull people together, but is then the need for a different flag or in addition to the flag, an effort to be different from the currently defined LGBTQIA++, and of course, all the initials in a way raise the same question, community, right? So, you know, is there attempt, again, to just keep marking differences? Is this an attempt to, you know, be noticed like Shea Diaz seems to want to be seen? So, you know, again, I think both of those questions get into the complications of, again, what does it mean to proliferate different flags or, different things on the flag to, you know, what, how in, in being, again, inclusive, can it be exclusive or can it mark the idea of separation as much as togetherness or, you know, what do folks make of that? So I'd love to hear what you all, all think about that one. Anyone want to jump in? Um, I, I mean, I can go in really quick just because I have been really interested in how the flag has become like that particular symbol. Um, and I'm thinking of the way, you know, the question has been, right, isn't like the rainbow itself meant to actually be inclusive, right? Like the, the rainbow, it's not like certain colors um, refer to, you know, gays and lesbians, right? And thinking of that as the limit of the originating discourse. Uh, but the I'll, I'll put aside the more cynical part of me that does want to be really, really critical of it and perhaps kind of think about, um, I don't know if it would have been around leather pride or I'm not sure when that original um, design for the trans flag came up, but there, I, I do have the sense that by kind of claiming the space of the flag, you know, ultimately it is metonymical and a strategic way of claiming space within the political mainstream discourse, right? I think that, you know, um, in the part of me that's cynical, 
wants to say yes, you know, like ultimately whatever is strategic, you know, if you represent a certain constituency, whether politically or at least on some sort of like, you know, even in an online Tumblr community, um, you know, that is precisely a, a way in which you're able to kind of, even if people are annoyed, like as in the case of Che, right, like it, it turns the lens toward that. Uh, and thinking even of the regional pride festivals, it's like, well, if that is a method that works, then to what extent is not the space where with the actual political realm that can have a potential material that can actually make a material difference, why shouldn't that be the, the window that's right open, right? Even, even if, again, I, I have lost track of how many flags there are by now. Yeah. Anyone else have thoughts about that? That you? I guess I just want to affirm what you said, Yvonne, um, thinking about uh, the, I mean, when you were talking about being swallowed by the machinery, Lynn, and I really loved, Alex, what you were talking about, um, sort of thinking about the liberalization of radical movements. When I think about the rainbow flag coming into MoMA, um, yes, it was, a moment in time where I think many people had a very joyful um, moment as they walked past it in a gallery. Um, there were many, many positive comments left by visitors. Um, it was something that was um, often very deeply engaged with. MoMA is also, like many museums in the US, a space where it costs $25 to enter, but there is a very specific demographic. It depends. I mean, MoMA, like many New York Manhattan-based museums are um, skew more heavily in their visitorship towards tourists, actually, than they do um, folks from the, the, um, the tri-state area. Um, MoMA, I mean, I worked there, I loved it. I think it's a wonderful collection. I also used to call it- up, but so make so money. Oh. Sorry, I used to call it the Wall Street of museums. It knows how to make money. It knows how to really bank an endowment, much like its friend down the street, the Met. Um, and creating a children's book, I mean, it's a, a wonderful thing in many ways. I've enjoyed reading this to many, many small people in my life, but at the same point in time, um, it is a product and MoMA's design collection has done many things during its lifetime, um, but it has really, really, really helped the um, uh, American consumer tell them what to buy and how to buy it and when to buy it and how to furnish their home and how to build their lives around very specific ideals that are dictated by a very narrow group of people. And so um, I think I just, Yvonne, I'm not really adding anything any more eloquently than you already put it, but I want to affirm that um, what you and Alex and um, Liz spoke about in terms of this sort of knife edge or um, tension um, is uh, very present. And so I think yeah, I, I also really appreciated, Alex, what you were um, picking apart in terms of this, this connection or disconnection, I, the preferred disconnection between citizenship and belonging. Um, one of the ways that I think about to belong most often and I see writ large in design history is through buying things and consuming things. And so um, there's a citizenship that is tied by our person, by capitalism more than anything else. Um, so yeah, the, the, those are just some of my thoughts in response to what has been said. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so to go to a couple other things, there's one, uh, a kind of follow up comment that I think ties to that I'll just read because I think it very much ties to what we're talking about, which is asking about the variety and inner community resistance to agreeing on a unanimous flag. And what does that say about the attempts to create community around sexuality? you know, either without or maybe precisely because of taking other identities into account. So I think that's an interesting comment on, on what it means to, either, you know, again, the resistance to agree on just one flag itself. Um, to move on to, on to other questions, uh, we have one from, from Evie Lincoln, again, one of the organizers of the Pembroke Seminar this year on color. So I think very much ties. So uh, Evie says, um, flags come from chivalry and heraldry, the necessity to show your allegiance on the battlefield so the wrong people don't kill you. So they're adversarial from the get-go. Most of the different flags 
how, and I, I think that, that Evie's referring to most of the different pride flags now, however, actually proclaim that the group wants to be fluid, right? So again, you get this paradoxically of an identity that's not identified necessarily, uh, you know, so, so what does that mean? And then she notes, and this ties to another the thing, Evie, I'm glad you brought this up that I wanted to ask, that she notes that it's interesting that none of these flags actually blended colors, so that there is, again, this sort of... We did, they absolutely so, did. The first pride flag had rainbow uh, tie-dye on it, sorry. Yes, exactly, yeah. Rooms. Yeah, so it absolutely did. And, I, and that ties to something I wanted to ask. I, I don't want us to lose Evie's question, so I'm just gonna call attention again, the way that even this history, that it came from the battlefield. So what do we make of that? And heraldry and that you don't wanna be killed. But to go to the, you know, about blending, I did notice uh, as, as you were just saying, Michelle, that, that there was tie-dye and you talked about the interest in the kaleidoscope. And to some degree, maybe that's just in my mind, but it to me kind of tied to something Liz said about the interest in, I can't pronounce this at all, cacophony of the sound, right? Both this like mixture of colors or mixtures of sound that I think both of you in a way offered as another way of thinking. I think the pride flags we're used to now, we don't think of as like a kaleidoscope. We think of as like stripes or the, chev the new edition of the chevron that almost looks like some stripes trying to kind of push themselves into like an arrow pushing themselves into other stripes. But it would be interesting to think, what if it had gone more towards like the, the kaleidoscope, the cacophony of either, you know, of color? What Would that have opened up something? Would that have been a, a more enriching symbol? Or again, are we striving, you know, is anything that becomes the symbol of the community a problem? Because no matter what the design is, it still becomes like a brand that then functions, as Alex pointed out, in international capitalism. So I don't know, but any, any thoughts about that? Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't, I said, Alex, I saw you raise your hand, but now I'm like already, I, but I'll keep mine very brief. I don't know if someone said it and I didn't hear it, but I just wanted to say one little thing um, related to, I don't know, it just popped into my mind. Did, does everyone know that the the a version of the rainbow flag is Cusco Peru's flag? And that's something I find very interesting. Like I went to Cusco and I'm like, what's the rainbow flag doing here? And it's their flag, you know, it's the flag for a town, um, which means that the rainbow flag is not in fact the only, it, for, I mean, that's why I asked the question in my poll how do you feel about the rainbow flag as a symbol of gay pride and why? Because the rainbow flag isn't just a symbol of gay pride, it's other things for other people. Um, so I think that's a, a, an important thing to think about as well. Like if there is such ownership of the rainbow flag as the symbol of all kinds of pride and, and a kind of identity but it's it's another kind of identity um that has to do with a place alex were you yeah um that's a that's a cool fact um i like that a lot actually um i have a a couple thoughts i'm i'm gonna blend a couple of the questions one of them is that um um, I personally think uh, it would be kind of cool if like that if we like sort of like uh, integrated that kind of adversarial element. Um, I think that there's, uh, you know, I was talking about a depoliticizing of a queer and trans movement. I think if there's actually something, um, you know, that there was uh, uh, something meaningful that people were fighting for, then that might imbue some new meaning into the flag. Um, though I do think that's like a, a very interesting kind of like thing to, to, to sort of integrate into our thinking about it. Um, I also think that, um, you know, the, the point about fluidity is interesting too. I, I, I think because, um, you know, with a flag, we're, or we're, we're and what, what I think is make, wow, let me try this again. What I think is maybe interesting about these sort of uh, uh, LGBT, et cetera, flags, like in particular, is that there's um, a desire that they be authentically representative, but also that they be like, um, you know, that they be like functional as flags. Um, like no one like, you know, no one like looks at a flag and you're like, oh yeah, that's really, that's, that's what Canada is. 
that's what the United States, I mean, or people maybe do, but like, what? Uh, anyway, I think, I think what's, what's interesting about them is that we actually like, um, uh, we hope that they will perform all these roles that, um, that we can't realistically expect a flag to do or any really symbol, any symbol really to do, which I think also fits in with the idea of, of it being a brand. And this is, um, some, have you noticed that every brand is now changing its, its colors to blue and yellow for the Ukrainian flag? Like in the same way that like in 2020, like all these brands like came up with all black logos. Um, is this just a thing that happens now? Like, I think, I think, <laughs> I think we should, um, and, and this is maybe something that I, I think, um, I don't know how many people here live in America, but I think this is something that um, if you do, you might not notice. But when I go to, I'm not American. When I go to America, everything is red, white, and blue. Everything, everything is red, white, and blue. Uh, it, it's it's a ubiquity that that feels like almost comical um flags are already brands um and brands are, already have like um tremendous symbols that are recognizable in almost the way of, of a flag um so I, I think it's interesting that um i don't know I, I i i as much as i think flags are distinct in the sense that they are national symbols um, I also think that like we shouldn't necessarily uh, um, treat them too much as exceptions. Like we actually already have a lot of uh, models for for how these sort of different things work, and and, and this this almost fits into something that uh, that uh, Michelle was pointing out before, like in, in terms of like people's relationship to different things at at the MoMA. Um, it's not just a flag that I think can get people very excited um, or make them feel like a sense of belonging or connection, though it does have that kind of role. Um, even the like even the MoMA itself has a kind of affective power. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's like um, on a purely aesthetic level, it's like kind of a sleigh that all the pride flags are so ugly. Like I think it, it's kind of funny. <laughs> like I'm not mad at it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, let these things do whatever they need to do. But but I think we also just need to like sort of um, allow ourselves to under signify them um, in, instead of sort of the, the way that they've been vested with so much, um, I don't know, significance and authority. Yeah, I like what you say really, oh, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, Michelle. I was going to just very quickly, I was going to say what you say really resonates. One of the other symbols that I collected at the same time as the pride flag was the, um, the peace sign, which originated as a nuclear disarmament sign based mm -hmm. um, by a young Royal uh, College of Art graduate, Jerry Holton, um, on semaphore flag positions. So the two strikes in the middle of it are the, um, uh, the letters that spell out campaign for nuclear disarmament or CND. So it was um, designed so it could be carried on a march in the late 1950s from London to Aldersham, I think, um, for to, to a nuclear center. And it was sort of the start of the conversation that then began many other protest activities, including the Women of Green and Common, the largest, long, most longstanding anti-nuclear protest, I think, in the world, um, in the UK. Long story short, um, when I researched these different um, symbols and icons, flags were part of this as well. I agree with you that they are part of a larger lexicon that has been instrumentalized in terms of its use in capitalism, its use in activist movements, et cetera. And I want to challenge or maybe just make us question the notion that has come up in some of the questions and even some of the things that we've been saying that um, the addition or even the invention of some of these symbols is meant to be a priori or deliberately inclusive. Um, what I see time and time again with design history is that when somebody designs something, even when they think they are designing it to be as broadly applicable or as useful or as um, helpful as possible, that um, is usually not the case, or it's usually a much narrower portion of a population or a demographic or an issue that they can actually solve for. And design so constantly thinks about itself as a discipline for solving things rather than asking questions. Um, and so I'm always interested, it comes back to, again to um, Evie Lincoln's question about chivalry and heraldry. Yes, these flags come from that history, which was about the battlefield suddenly, but also about delineating family trees and family lineage. And there's something about exclusion or about delineating um, that is the opposite of inclusion. And I think that's part of the tension here. I don't think that we can um, always assume that the first or even the best intention of the creation of any symbol, including a flag, is um, complete and absolute inclusion. Um. 
Yeah, I mean, actually, that, that is perfect because I was just thinking, I mean, the cynical part of me started creeping up because I just looked at pride flags and I saw that it's like a, a straight ally pride flag <laughs> and that that seems like really terrible. But actually, I think that you made me think about that you like that the three of you actually made me think about would be, you know, when are moments in which a certain kind of like opposite or negative hailing come and I'm trying to think right of like how any of us would react to the moment of a burning of the pride flag not like at a queer you know anti periodist rally but at a Trump rally right and thinking of like how you know the moments in which yeah sure acts of homophobic or transphobic violence are aimed precisely at flag right or the moments in which perhaps around narcissistic fear around my well, potential safety, right? I feel hailed by it. And I want to think of that as a potential case limit as somebody who is all for, you know, pride, you know, flag, or the flag burning in general, uh, thinking of whether, you know, like, that is a moment of hailing that maybe, I don't know if it answers a lot of this, but could also open up, what does it mean when it does become desecrated? And can one actually let go of those attachments at a moment of violence? Mm. Interesting. So we're nearing the end. I, I want to, we have two more, uh, one question really and one comment. So I, I'd like to, to put both of those on, on the table uh, and then we'll, we'll close uh, this part of it. Um, so the question comes from Harper, uh, who says, uh, I'm curious about the actual colors of the pride flag and its iterations specifically how the redesign includes colors, the colors of the trans flag, which are uh, perplexingly the preferred colors of gender reveal parties, uh, plus an apparently non-binary white, um, and how those abut the black and, and brown stripes that refer to their subjects iconically rather than symbolically. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts about the actual redesigns of the officially titled Progress Pride flag and its multiple and divergent signifying regime. So, so that's a question from Harper that I hope you'll all keep in the back of your mind while I also read now the final comment that comes from Dale, who says, I super appreciate the conversation and totally get a lot of what's being said, but I still value and appreciate the rainbow flag. I grew up in Montana and had no exposure to gay culture until I was in my mid twenties. So the flag was always a symbol of peace, hope, acceptance, and love. The community that I needed to be part of and that would understand me. And then thank you for the thoughts. So I think that Dale puts in a, an important reminder, uh, but I also think that, that Harper asked some important questions about, again, exactly what signified in some of the redesigns. And again, some that, you know, what do we think of the use of the pink and blue, but it is also quite different from, you know, one off, you know, others. So again, I, I think that those final question, uh, questions and comments are useful. So we'd love to hear what people think. And it looks like uh, Alex has their hand up uh, and, and Liz, so love to hear from both of you and then anyone else on the panel who wants to, to add in. You go Alex. first time, Alex. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, if you insist. Um, really quickly, I think the pink and blue is just gender. Like, I don't, like, I, like, not to be, like, that simplistic, but, um, I don't know. Like, I think, I think we know what it stands for. Um, yeah, but what do you think <laughs> of the fact that pink Well, because blue people are, people are, are, because being transgender is about a relationship to gender. Like, I don't, like, I, I don't, um, I think, I think we could read more into it, but I don't think we have to. Like, um, when I wear pink things, I feel more feminine. Which a hundred years ago might have been really different because exactly, actually yeah. it meant are... very different things at the turn of the 20th century and actually were preferred the opposite way around for babies. Yeah, um, no, no, I mean, like these things are, are contextual and contingent. Totally, absolutely. Um, but, I, but I think we, we know why these things, and I think, um, and, you know, inevitably, anytime there's something that, that kind of comes down to like a representation of groups, like people are making choices. Um, and some of them are, and what I thought was like uh, some, an, an interesting thing that, that came up, um, so I keep bouncing back to you, uh, Michelle, and, and sort of your 
comments on this was, uh, and I mean, maybe I'm misinterpreting, is that uh, I think um, as much as we're making, you know, what we think to be political choices, we're also mostly just making design choices. And I think maybe it's just like, um, um, you know, they, they're, they, they pick, the yeah, they, they pick shades that seem to kind of work there. I think what's more interesting is, is um, the choice of like uh, black and brown. Um, uh, I think like not because I, I like have any issue with you know effort at that kind of inclusion, but I think it's, it's interesting that then people often end up being in the position where you have to like defend a kind of inclusion that you actually don't agree with because it's an inclusion in, a, in an inherently flawed kind of uh, liberal political project. Um, you know, inclusion in a kind of representation, uh, you know, that gets slapped on the side of police cars that are actually like committing violence against black and brown people. Um, but I don't know, like it's, I, I, as critical as I am of flags and the other symbols, I also do want to acknowledge sort of the other point that was made here is that like, I, I think that nothing is ever all good or all bad. A yeah. flag isn't capitalism. You know, it's, I, I, and, and as much as I'm sort of treating it like a shorthand and people maybe do when they talk about like a rainbow capitalism or something, it's not, we're not hating on the rainbow. You know, like things have different functions in, in, in different places. Um, I don't know. I feel like I, I sort of like a like sums like a like a bucket of water over <laughs> these questions. Um, you know, but uh, but I I think it's I think it's good to think uh, critically whether we end up on the other side liking something more or less. Um, the point is that we don't lose our politics in the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Liz, oh, it's a nice place maybe to end there. I mean, I my my thoughts after uh, Dale's comment and then the other person's question just about color and meaning and and the importance of the rainbow flag. Like, I mean, that was my, the project that I did where I was kind of deconstructing and reconstructing the rainbow flag and also reminding people of the origins of those colors, like what the colors meant, um, you know, by having those banners, like pink was for sex and turquoise was for art. Um, and those are the colors that dropped out. And now we're talking about the pink and the blue being like gender colors, you know. So it's interesting like that they they did mean something else initially when Gilbert Baker yeah. started with this. And it was a kind of more pagan and like life affirming content that he was talking about with each color being spirit and sun and you know, um, so I, I still kind of hold on to those meanings for the rainbow flag. And um, I also really appreciate like the, the reason I wanted to look at it is because it was such a complicated symbol and, and do that poll where you could hear one person saying exactly what Dale just said about like, this thing is important to me. I live in a, a place where my, my, identity is threatened constantly. And this is like a beacon of safety. I mean, that's not what they all said, but I, I got so many replies that were like that. And people who came out when they were in their sixties and said like, I would see it in a coffee shop and I had just left my wife and my children and I would feel safe. And so it's, it's just um, something that I like to kind of celebrate. And I personally like still am a rainbow flag lover, even though living in New York City and watching Pride roll out in June is like a horror show because the Chase Bank and every other corporation has the flag in its window. So it, it is true, like Alex just said, it's like every, you know, it's every, it's a lot of things to a lot of people and good and bad. And yeah. I'm glad that we got to talk about it, really. Yes. <laughs> Liz, am I. I just have to add the um, the turquoise and the pink came out because they were too expensive to produce. So it was a design decision. Um, it yeah. ended up not being part of, it went from eight colors to six colors because it was just much more expensive to use those colors and to have eight rather than six. Um, yep. But I do firmly believe that design um, is always political in some sense. Sometimes it does just come down to the the, the politics of of whether you can afford it or not or, or how, you, how, how easily distributable you want something to be. But I think that, you know, again, it's a great place to end because I think that these final reflections, again, they show the way all of these issues are very imbricated together, the economics, the politics, the aesthetics, and, and they show how these things are always constantly changing and changeable. 
And as Alex reminds us, we need to always be a part of that. Our politics have to always be to be engaged with the things around us to, to try to create the best politics around them. So I thank you all so much for your contributions to this. I think it was a really interesting uh, a really interesting and productive discussion. And so I really thank all our panelists. Please join me everybody in thanking the panelists. I know we can't hear you clapping, but I'm imagining the sound of everybody clapping. Um, I also just want to very quickly say that uh, our next LGBTQIA plus thinking event will be a screening that we are putting on in collaboration with Magic Lantern Cinema. Uh, that that uh, does uh, screenings of experimental shorts. So we're putting together a program called Queer Spaces and Places, Global LGBTQ Short Films and Videos. It's gonna be a wonderful screening. It will be on March 21st at 5.30 PM. That's a Monday, 5.30 at Martinos Auditorium in the Granoff Center at Brown. We also hope to have all or some of it online. Uh, but hopefully people for community will come out to the in-person screening and more info will be coming out about that soon. So keep an eye out on, uh, you know, the Pembroke events uh, for info about that, as well as many other wonderful things the Pembroke Center is doing. Uh, so just wanted to announce that. And then I guess, again, thank, uh, thank you to all of our participants. Thank you to the amazing Pembroke staff and the staff at Media Services uh, for helping make this happen. And thank you to the audience for sticking it out. And I hope that everybody has um, a nice, uh, peaceful, in these times, peaceful evening. So thank you all.